Howdy folks. Oh boy, what a week. <clears throat> I do hope everyone is good. Uh, Friday stream instead of Wednesday. Apologies for that. It's just been a super busy week. Uh, and I really wanted to get all the hardware PCB design finished and the um, bill of materials and that kind of stuff ready to make the, um, the test boards, test hardware. So I have been rather busy as you can imagine. I have my tea, we are ready to rock. Ooh, it's a little hot. How is everyone, anyhow? I hope you had a good week. Mine's been very productive. Um, My chair is getting wonkier and wonkier. It doesn't break in the middle of this. That would be embarrassing. Hmm. And my laptop seems to be racing. Yeah, I know. It is very loud for some reason. I'm just... It just suddenly kicked in really hard. I'll just see if it calms down a bit. I'm trying to avoid running the browser. Um, let's just give it a few seconds. Let's move on to the clip mics now. That's probably slightly better as well. The old level mics should give a better ratio of signal to noise. Is that a bit better? Yeah, it's cooling down a bit now. Maybe that fan will switch off in a minute. So, um, I saw you saw what you were saying, um, Laurie. On your um, uh, LCD driver. Hold on, looking at the wrong thing. So you're saying that for the Black Ice MX and your LX3 it's reliable, but when you run it on the uh, Black, Black Ice 2, you have some issues with the uh, initial reset. But why would it be different? I mean, you're driving the reset from the FPGA in both cases, i.e. a PMOD pin. I mean, I don't know which pins you're using, but... I mean, those pins should be the same. You know, it's the same chip in both cases from the MX2. Sorry, the BMX, Black Ice MX, is the uh, same chip as we've got on the um, Black Ice. But the PLLs are the same as well. It's the same chip. No, I don't quite get what the um, issue is. Um, ooh, hope I don't get any frame drop. I just saw my rate go down a tad bit. You only use the PLL on Black Ice 2. So that's the difference, maybe. Um, so maybe it's not a reset problem. Maybe it's a... Um, 
just a clock issue. That first two needs to be allowed because of the 100 megahertz clock. What clock? What 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 do you um, PLL the clock to? What frequency? Twenty five megahertz. Um, Um, so the only difference between the two then is one uses a PLL and the other doesn't. Alright, you're going to go out, Twinks. I'm going to go in, mother. That seems more likely than the to be the issue than the, the reset, I would guess. LCD and OLED screens have endless problems with reset timing. That's, that's strange. Normally you think you reset by a period of time, a minimum amount of time, and then you do your stuff and that's it. Normally what reset is used for. There's clearly something odd going on with the reset on this, or the use of reset on these. Are you having to issue multiple resets? Or just a single reset? This glass is a very reflective. Where's the light coming from? Let's just add a bit more um, light here. I get a, a round problem with using with an external reset pin in the sync clock domain. Yeah, that sounds really weird. So strange that it's sensitive to reset. Reset tends to be very simple normally. It's kind of weird that it's um, causing such aggro. Let me just check my um. My Wi-Fi. Going on here, not quite work out. I just look at my network settings, bear with me a sec. I'm just wondering whether it's using the right connection here. Uh, yeah, it's using the Ethernet. I wonder if it's trying to connect both. Right, Ethernet's connected, Wi Fi. Let 
Why on earth the Wi Fi is not on? But is it actually connected? Connect to a wireless network. And I think I'm okay with that. Sorry, going off mumbling about my network connection because I'm seeing it going up and down a bit. So, it, by the sounds of it, it sounds like the um, the reset needs to be synchronous with the um, FPGA internal synchronization clock that you're using to synchronize all of your other flip flops. So it's not like it's asynchronous or something, it's kind of weird, isn't it? What just kind of strange because resets normally asynchronous not synchronous I mean who designs a reset that is synchronous it's just I don't quite understand it's like it's not a reset it's like it's something odd so when you're using this reset Laurie tell me do you just issue the reset once and then just use it normally and don't need to use the reset again or are you having to continually use the reset at different points in time I mean, I don't have any personal experience of driving these things. Just once. That's right. That's what you'd expect. But normally it's asynchronous. That's kind of weird that it needs some kind of synchronization. I don't quite get that. Unless it's the way that you do the resets in the code. Um... You're not operating the reset in a strange way, are you? That means that the timing of the reset differs depending on the clock. I mean, if it's both at 25 megahertz, shouldn't be any different between the two. Or it comes from the PLL or or from um, mm. I did just have one thought. I was just thinking, could the Black Ice MX be running at a slightly different clock speed? But I don't think it is. I'm pretty sure that's 25 megahertz. And again, um, what does the ULX3 run at? The 3S. Has that got a 25 megahertz clock as well? Yeah, both 25 megahertz. Unless the PLL's wrong, could that be the case? Did you have a look at the... Um, can you output the clock and see what frequency it's running at? On the Black Mice 2 with the PLL. Anyhow, moving on. Um, uh, I want to come back round, sort of, not to the Black Ice 2, but to the software a bit later. Um, first, I just want to do a review. Um, 
with the boards. Hold on, you get eager. Up. So I've had a really busy week, and I, I was determined to just get all the hardware design bits and pieces and all the checks done, which I've pretty much done. I've got a, one more little check which I'm leaving for the weekend. Uh, just giving myself some time. Um, so let me just get through, go through what I'm my intentions are ordering. Um, probably the best thing to do. Let's do. Um, let's open uh, the ice logic deck first. That's probably the best thing. We can look at each one of these in turn, just in case there's any feedback. There's still an opportunity for me to change things. Um, uh, let me open this first. Nice logic bench. Let me just get these on screen as well so that we can see them. Just bear with me just one second, folks. First, uh, let me just get the schematic as well. Why don't you show me the schematic, man? It's really weird. Right, so, um, so the ice logic bench, so the ice logic deck is done. I do have a couple of final checks I'm going to make, but yeah, it, I mean it's done. I'm not really likely to change anything unless we come up with something. Um, this evening. Trying to maximise it. Yeah, sorry folks, it's not huge. But anyhow, you get the picture. So uh, here is the laid out version. So let me explain what's going on. Let me just get rid of all of the um, complicated stuff. Right, 
<clears throat> I may repeat myself somewhat from what I may have already said here. Um, so, just to remind you, so the logic bench here contains five tiles. One, sorry, tile one, two, three, which is a super tile. I'll come back to that in a minute. Four and five. Notice one, one, two, um, four and five. Both of those have cuts in the outline at the top. So that the, the reason that I do the cuts is to allow for taller components because in, in, in many cases the tile um, in this case this is not a good example but the tiles here everything's on top but normally the, the components will be on the bottom of the tile facing down to the board. Okay, um, but some face up, some face down. But if you can face them down, face them down. Um, that's the default. It's something like a breadboard tile, like this one. Clearly, you don't want that face down because you won't be able to plug anything into the breadboard. Not only that, it's too tall and it will flatten everything underneath. Um, seven segment or any kind of display thing obviously that has to be uh, pointing upward if it's not pointing upwards then there's no way you be able to see it but for everything else um, that will be pointing downward so on here that's why we've got this cut out for all of the non super tiles That allows us to extend a bit further. So for some of the tiles that have <laughs> some of the tiles that have taller um, profiles. So if you look at something like a, you know, a D type, which we'd be using for like a VGA tile then the height of that is greater than the gap between the board uh, between the tile and the logic deck so when you do that um, you need to allow for a gap so what happens is this then drops down through that gap here below and normally the logic bent uh, logic deck is suspended on standoffs as well so it's got some height so there's plenty of room there to do most of the things that are required so that's what those cutouts are for um, I don't have an example here I mean another example would be you know an ethernet tile because um, that height is pretty high as well. In fact, that's probably higher than the uh, VGA tile. I'll put them together. It's about 15 mil, something like that. Apologies for the interruption. So that's what, a, what the cutouts are for. Um, I have a battery backup here for the STM32. That's just like a 2032 type device, which is optional. Um, on the um, super tile position here, you also notice underneath we've got power connectors so that we can fill power into the tiles. Okay, that's what these are. There's two ways of powering this, either via those connectors, via a tile that acts as a power tile, or from the mezzanine as well, you can power it. So in the example, where one of the ones that I'm working on is a, a, is a USB power delivery mezzanine. 
that powers into our system. I need to come back round to that at some point. The mezzanine is the one remaining item that I need to complete. I say complete, there's going to be different options. But I need to do something for this particular test build. Um, and I think everything else we've covered before. So at the front here, we've got the two USB ports. Uh, so it's slightly different. We have the debug connector here um, for the STM32. Uh, and we've got the DFU button slash mode button if we ever need the modes, which is similar you know, to what we used to do on the uh, on the Black Ops 2. So that's ready to go. Um, are there any questions on that before I move on? Because I'm just going to move straight onto the tiles that I'm going to order as well. There's an SD card underneath this as well, by the way, that you can't see. Okay, so moving on. Oh, oh, the other thing with the power is broken into two zones. We've got a zone, power zone A, which does tiles one to three, and power zone B, which just does the two um, uh, right and most or eastern tiles, i.e. tiles four and five. Um, that's experimental at the moment. I'm not sure if I'll keep that or not. There are issues with going this route, but I mean it might be useful to have two different power zones. It might be a useful facility. Right, so that's um, that's the logic deck, obviously. Now, in terms of tiles, what I'm going to order for testing are let's do, let's do, let's do, let's do. Uh, we've got a camera tile, which is this one. Um, so that just accepts something like a, an OV76, 7650 is it? I forget the number now. I should know this. Um, so here, because this is a tile, the connector is, is facing us. All the components are facing us. But when that goes down onto the logic deck, because those components are facing the actual um, 7670. Thank you, Laurie, for the correction. OB7670. When when these these are facing down, so what happens is the uh, flexi cable that goes into the FPC connector here goes up through can go up through this slot or come down through this slot. So the actual camera can sit on top because remember it's going to be flipped uh, when you look at it once it's installed. So uh, that's a camera tile. Um, so I'm ordering that board as well because that's done. Um, there's a few pins I'm not using on here. So there's two mixed signal pins and there's two digital pins. Uh, those digital pins either come from the STM32 or they come from the FPGA depending which slot you use. If you use a super tile slot for the camera then everything's driven by the FPGA so you've got two extra FPGA signals that are unused. Um, the SDA will be driven by the FPGA in that case. If it's in a normal slot then the I2C is driven is driving the um, is, the I2C is driven by the STM32 so depending where you um, place it. Um, but because we've got those extra signals, I was wondering, well, is there something else we can add on here that might be useful? We've effectively got two mixed signals and two digital signals that can be used for something. Um, so if you've got any ideas for that, let me know. But for the moment, that is kind of um, how the, uh, um, the camera, book, camera tile looks. Um, 
any questions on the camera tire? If not, we shall just um, go straight to the next one, which will be uh, right. So this is the double P mod tile. Because we no longer include the P mod connectors on the ICE Logic deck itself, we have to provide a mechanism for adding that. So I've designed a super tile that converts the super tile to a P mod. In fact, it converts it to a double P mod, as you can see here. Uh, and again, um, what I'd probably do here is install these connectors on the reverse. So this is actually the right way around. We're looking at the top here, the connectors underneath for the super tile. And then even though these look like they're in top, they can go on the top or they can go on the bottom. I'd probably insert them on the bottom because it looks neater and it's lower level. That means that any P mod that you're plugging in is going to be more at the level of the actual uh, logic deck rather than the top. Because otherwise it's going to be well high. Um, of course, what you've got to remember is with that configuration, which I think will be default for me, the P mod will be flipped uh, in terms of the uh, the IOs on top and bottom, the power and uh, the um, ground as saying because they're parallel. But um, when it, so when it comes to the PCF file or the um, MYG board file, we need to appropriately set those so we get them the right way around. Um, that's just uh, an issue with the board file or the PCF file, not a hardware issue. Um, so that's done as well, and that that will only work in a super tile position because it needs all 16 signals. Most tiles don't have 16 FPGA signals, they only have 12. Only the super tile has 12 signals that are connected to the FPGA, and that's the center one. So it operates in a similar way to the way the uh, earlier design worked. It's just that the P mod functionality is brought to you by the super tile adapter. Also means you can swap it out, and it's better from a signal integrity point of view than the old system we had because we had a kind of fork of the IOs, you know, either to the P mods or to the tile. But you know, you had basically um, uh, spurs which weren't good for signal integrity to this sort that out really. So that's the P mod. Any questions on the um, double P mod tile? Okay, so next, so that's obviously going to be on the order. Um, the next one, which we've probably covered before, is just the prototype P mod. Um, and in this case, I, I think I've been through all this before. So this column here is all the IOs and uh, the mix signal and a reset. And then on the top here, you've got STA, the I squared C stuff. These are power buses across the top and bottom. Same down here. And then you've got uh, an optional, you can solder on a surface mount 2.54 mil pitch or 0.1 inch pitch. Um, and that enables you to um, get to the signals um, on a header. For example, if you want to kind of do a tested in the middle type thing and then this can be used in the same way that the other PMOS use it's really like a patch board you can just put some simple components in and then maybe a connector on this end to go to something it's useful for just trying out different things very useful I'm um, going to dwell on that too much um, so that's the proto board um, 
the other thing is the breadboard uh, it's difficult to see that that's let me show you that that doesn't really look any different from this the only difference is I've this version had uh, I think uh, eight IOs this one has 12 plus the STMs and it's just a way of adding that nice little breadboard in on top as part of the overall design so if you want to be breadboarding on top you can do that and just hook up your signals from the connectors top and bottom very simple Um, next we have, which one haven't I done yet, um, okay there's the seven segment uh, tile, again another popular one, this is popular on the um, PMOL format so has kind of put it across into the tile format. Um, the way to view this is we're looking at the component, surface mount component side, including the connector, which these will be face down to the logic, logic uh, depth itself. Whereas, and also the header is facing down as well, but point at best of right angle I'm pointing out. The seven segment display is actually on the other side that we're looking at through here. So in reality that will end up on top, much like um, much like we have here with the uh, display on top. This one is poppy. Um, there's no significant changes with that. Uh, it's very similar to the uh, PMOD version. Um, it's a bit more optimized for this because the number of signals is more optimized for the tile. It doesn't waste as many signals as the PMOD one does. So that's done. We're going to get that one ordered as well. So we can test that. Um, Again, popular on the um, PMOD side is the VGA, um, VGA PMOD. So we've done a, uh, a VGA PMOD here. Now, in this case, all the components are on the underside here. So um, Let's just check something. Where is it? I need to check the height on that. Okay. So I remember. It's 14. Yeah, I need to double check I've gone deep enough on that. I think I have. Um, be embarrassing if it doesn't fit. Anyhow, so um, what what we have on the um, audio video tile is analog VGA output, you know, from a resistor level ladder DAC driven by a you know a HCT or low voltage HCT driver and um, an audio connector for stereo output so we've got some analog audio out as well so it's kind of um, analog video and audio basically that's what this does it's a few extra signals and those go up to pads on the top and you could solder on a kind of six pin dual roll double Three pin dual row 0.1 inch surface mount connector if you want to get access to those. Again, um, it's just exposing those extra signals in case they're useful for something. I won't populate those, those can be manually populated if you need the extra signals. 
again, functionality is very similar to the P to the uh, P mod version, except um, the audio combination is slightly different. Uh, I think on the P mod that we did, it had uh, something else, but I can't remember exactly. So we're going to make some of those as well. I'm going to order some of those PCBs so we can get this tested. Um, I think there's one other one other tile that I'm going to order. Um, checking my list. And this is the new um, motor tile. Um, this is better than the other tile, motor tile that I had because I'm using a more robust uh, motor driver. And something that's a bit more flexible as well that enables me to use this board or anyone to use this board in some different configurations. Um, this is based around the uh, A9450 and I'll probably change that to the Texas version. Texas do a TI do an equivalent. I can't remember the number off the top of my head. Um, but it's pin for pin compatible. So depending on what I can get hold of, that's what finally threw it in the end. I could place either of these on there given the uh, supply issues that we've got. Um, and this will drive, you know, up to a maximum of 3.5 amps per per coil or per motor, depending on what sort of combination of motors you're putting in here. Um, so in its configuration right now, you could drive three brushed DC motors, for example, uh, each at about three and a half amps, up to three and a half amps max, normally well below that. Um, the current control is electronic. We have a DAC on board, that's what this device is. That sets the uh, VREF on these for the current feedback, for the current foldback the limit. Um, the, you can use this in different ways as well. So for example, I could configure this such that I drove one brushless motor and one stepper so these two bottom ones could drive a stepper and the top one could drive a brush motor um, the stepper itself would not be micro stepping it could only do uh, full or half bipolar steps I might be able to get it to do some quarter and other tricky stuff by modulating the DAC uh, on the current limit, but I haven't played around with that yet to see how quickly we can do that and what what that means in terms of um, performance. Um, I guess you, you, you could also drive, um, possibly you could drive a uh, brushless, D, uh, brushless DC motor, but not with field oriented control because we don't have um, enough current control for that but if you wanted it to use it like an ESC uh, that's entirely possible uh, on the encoder side if we look down here so the information we put, take back from the motors um, if we look at these for example here A, B and S2 what that means so there are three channels of A, B, S uh, A and B would be feedback from an encoder that could be quadrature encoded it could also be an I2C um, uh, position device, rotary magnetic device, like the Austrian Micro ones. Um, the S part of that can be used as an end stop or a start stop for homing and things, um, if you wished. Or you could all use all three. Um, Spotted a mistake. Mm. 
No, those are really just for end stops. <clears throat> uh, that's their primary purpose. <clears throat> so you've got encoders plus you've got end stops. Uh, and the encoders can take two different forms like uh, quadrature encoding or you could drive them on squared C if you wish. Um, <clears throat> For the I squared C, you probably want to terminate the uh, I squared C device with pull-ups because we don't include them on here. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other signals on there. There's the uh, um, there's a spare DAC output. There's the um, enable and reset signals are available on that header as well. Notice I'm using a triple header um, and I can get triple right angle. So that's actually going to face out here. And all of this is on the underside of the tile again. So all you'll see is the back of this board, which doesn't have anything wrong. <clears throat> so that's the new motor board. Um, Laurie was asking, yeah, sorry, let me go back so I can just remind you. I'm sorry, there's a bit of a delay turnaround. So, yes, on the VGA, uh, sorry, the A audio video, the analog audio video tile, yes, this, this connector next to it is a stereo 3.5 jack. Does that answer your question, Lauren? Sorry, I missed it earlier. Let's go back to the uh Um, have I covered everything on this motor tile? So yeah, it's quite a flexible um, motor driver really. It's quite powerful. Um, it's, it's kind of mid-range power. It's not that really high power like a high power brushless DC. But it will do all of your small motors for small robotic stuff. Um, and a lot of automation stuff. So those are all the bits and bobs that are going to be ordered. The one thing that's remaining is the mezzanine board. And I'm really stumped on the mezzanine board. I've got one design, but it's quite complicated and it has lots of components on it. And I'm not sure if I want to go straight to that because there's a lot of complexity to add. What I might do is something simpler just for the test phase and then do a more complex mezzanine board um, a bit later on. Because there's going to be an awful lot to do on the software front, um, which is what we're going to move on to um, talk about next. But before we move on, um, I guess what's it let me know what you think is important for the mezzanine board i guess one of the nice things is being able to drive that um, uh, lcd type you know spy plus reset so i should probably include that connector on it even for the most basic mezzanine board because that's a nice feature uh, i do have a design for this by the way it's just not rooted yet because I'm not sure what I'm going to put on it and I've got lots of other bits on there. Um, so this would be the thing that drives the um, LCD. 
Then we've got optionally two channels of power, USB power delivery here. Uh, the Wi-Fi thing I'm not entirely convinced by at this point. I'm leaning towards doing something simpler than putting the Wi-Fi on there. I need to think about that. That really does complicate things by starting to put this on there. Um, I've also got a battery charger as well. And the whole thing's just got mighty complicated and I just want to do a simpler mezzanine to start with and then maybe a more advanced one later. So I might take off, say, the Wi-Fi. You know, maybe do this. Get rid of the Wi-Fi. Get rid of the charger. Um, maybe just add in here a couple of, you know, quick connectors. Hold on. Let me show you what I mean. loading its library Laurie agrees with me putting the LCE on there that's quite an important one um, the well oh, do I have this library installed on this drive, I'm going to have to sort this out at some point. Uh, which library is this in? Right. These are quite high density. I might need to change these. I don't have, I can't see the library for um, the smaller ones, uh, the larger, you know, stemma type connectors. These are like the quick 1 mil spacing I squared C connectors. I might, maybe I can have one 1 mil and one larger is it two mil stem connection then I've then I've got both of my bases covered what those are good for adding on are external things like for example an IMU an I squared C um, there's all sorts of sensors temperature sensors and humidity sensors and you name it. you know basically I squared peripherals that you connect either on the quick connector or on the stem connectors so I think that would be useful to have on the initial mezzanine board um, so it might look more like that probably without the Wi-Fi without the charge at this point because that just adds quite a lot of complexity Um, any thoughts? Anything else that you'd like to see on the mezzanine board? There is potential for one more SPI peripheral. Well, one minute. How many have we got? One, two, two, three, yeah, there's potential for either two FPGA pins or two SPI peripherals. So I don't know what else would be useful. Some buttons. Good idea, Nori. Um, what sort of buttons? Hmm. 
they would need to go on the top obviously which is a pain <sighs> trying to avoid double uh, double-sided boards they're a nightmare to manufacture <laughs> Literally, the cost doubles. Um, or assembly cost. Mm. Any preference on buttons, Laurie? I mean, do we just go with, you know, these type of buttons you've got on the uh, ice core? kind of push buttons or using switches or dips or what reset button often useful okay. um, let me just check something I've got some buttons on order from Ali and it turned up they've been taking months to come. Uh, okay, I'm just gonna put a note on there for a moment. Uh add touch. adding a note and a schematic so then I won't um, forget it. Let me use a very large font. Yeah, I can add a couple of push buttons. Now, would you want such buttons wired to the FPGA? Seems easier to wire them to the STM32 for me. Always well, seems a waste using FPGA pins <laughs> for buttons. Somewhat overpowered using buttons and is there anything else so I just need to keep my sugar level up give me for a sec whilst you're having a think FPGA is most useful So I've got two IOs. You want me to do two buttons to the FPGA, yeah? I can do that with the extra two buttons. So if one, one can be reset or whatever you want, and the other can be um, you know, general purpose. <clears throat> uh, I don't know if it can go to a global pin. I'm not sure if I've got any global pins left. Let me just check something. Hold on. I don't think it is a global. I don't think either of those that are left over are global or something. <coughs> mm. 
Let's see, it's stuck in the thing. Um, let me just check here. I need to be very careful about my pin use. These spare um, pins. Minute. Two of them are definitely output only. So one can be the select for the LCD, the other can be command. The clock, no, not clock. Command, hold on, let me just. Um, is it command? No, it's data or command, isn't it? No. C slash D. Something like that. On the LCD. C. Anyway. C slash D. I'm just going to invite DS. No, no, yes, yeah. Um, so I've got two other pins can be input or output. One is LD and the other is LC. Why did I call them LD and LC? Let me just check on the mezzanine connector. Check I'm taking the right pins up. MTO. T. MTO. Don't know why I called it that. Anyhow, there's two pins I can use. On the left hand side of that connector. Um, these probably aren't the right buttons, but let's just copy it anyhow. Just putting them on so I don't forget, don't worry. Something quickly. Neither of those are global, I'm afraid. That shouldn't be a problem though, should it? I mean, it's less convenient, obviously, but you can route them to a global one. Um, uh, 
You can always route them to a global bus, can't you, internally? And these would need to be on the other side. So I'm just trying to think. The LCD is slightly offset on this side, so we could have it on here. Which would be nice. So these would be on the left hand side. Um, and they'd be on the other board. So they'd be adjacent to the um, LCD. That uses up all the pins, I think. So the only question is whether I bother putting two power delivery things on there. I'll have a think. Anything else missing or desirable um, that you can think of, Laurie, on the mezzanine? Doing for time eight ten ish. Okay, yeah, well, I'm happy with that first version. I'll get that routed over the weekend and add that to the um, to the order because I'm not actually putting the order in until probably Sunday evening. So I just want to make sure that everything's fine and I don't think of anything else and that all the decisions I've made in the last few days are what I want them to be. Um, always worth doing that cool um right i'm gonna have to open the browser this is probably gonna make my fan worse but the other thing i wanted to talk about here was software let me just get a refill i'm just going to mute myself temporarily And then I will be back in just a sec and we can talk about um, some software stuff. Bear with me.
back again. So, um, what do I need? Right, here's something I was looking at. Let's see if I can bring this up. You can help me here, perhaps, Laurie. Let me just bring it up on the screen. Right, so... Um, So obviously you know that I want to do the Rust firmware, but in addition to that I was thinking it would be really nice if I could add in Arduino support. Um, I was just looking at this one, yeah I don't know if one is right or one is wrong or what the various Again, you'll have to help me out here a little, um, Laurie, because I don't really know much about the Arduino world. But I thought it might be nice if we could port the stuff to Arduino as well, so that the folks that do like to go the C route, or C slash C plus, could also play so again you know I've got most of C++ code done to do the programming and stuff that be I think that'd be fairly trivial to port to the Arduino framework and then we could also take what um, Richard has done with the um, quad SPI and port that to the STM32 uh, F7 version but the hardest bit is probably getting the F7, STM32 F7, uh, 730, which is the chip that we're using both on the Black Ice MX and also on the uh, Ice Logic deck. Because that's not currently on this list, although the other F7s are. Um, just check see what Laurie's saying here so what the page I'm looking at here is for Arduino STM support uh, let me just check it's called STM32 Duino uh, what Laurie's saying is there are two or more versions of the STM32 Arduino there is STM32 Duino which is what I'm looking at there um, and there is grumpy old pizza versions 
and then there are official Arduino ARM implementations. Um, I wonder um, wonder how up to date or maintained some of this stuff is. I think Richard used a grumpy old pizza one, didn't he? Do you know why he went down that route? Do you know of any pros and cons between the different things? Just forgetting the official one for the moment. Oh, this is taking ages. Grumpy old pizza versions used by Richard Miller is based on the official ARM version. Official in what sense? Who is the official here? Is that ARM computers official or is that Arduino official? As in the Arduino folks. Organisation. I'm just having a look to see how well maintained this is. So, um, it's quite a bit of activity there. Not all that was. Nice. That was back in last year, and there's still some regular activity here, which is quite good. Um, official Arduino official for their arm boards. Okay, so the grumpy old pizzas are based more on the. What's the, what's the URL, um, Laurie? I know we've looked at it before. So one of the things I like here is if I wanted to add the new variant, the instructions here seem easy enough, and it seems to use the STM32 how, which will probably make it relatively easy for me. The instructions here seem reasonable. I don't know if that's the case with the um, funky old pizza version. Let's have a look. Grumpy old pizza. That's a really odd name. <laughs> uh, this is Arduino Core for STM32L0. This is all like L series. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that would cover F. Arduino Core STM32 L4 is targeted at ultra low power scenarios. Um, maybe that's why Richard chose it. Because he was bought in it for the L433. You know, the L series have a different, um, slightly different setup to the F series. So maybe that's why he went down that route. And that's based on the Arduino Core Sam D. I'm just having a look. Drivers, Linux and Windows. Hmm? I'm looking in the right place.
The core is based on and compatible with, with the Arduino Sam D core. So the repository contains a source code and configuration file for the Arduino core for the app now Sam D21. Used on the Arduino Genino Zero blah 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 blah. I mean, hmm. I don't know what these um. Let me just um, back up here. Incapings variant. So, what low level drivers do they use? I'm trying to work out. So, on these grumpy old pizza ones, how are they driving the low level hardware? Are they using the STM HAL? STM32 HAL? at all or are they not using any of that what's what's right at the base so if we look at spy source See, I don't, they don't seem to be bringing in the how libraries, I don't think. I'm just trying to work out what it's all based on. The um, the one that I linked to at the beginning is based on the STM32 how. Well, I know the Sam D won't use the STM32 how. But are they using Sam? Like a Sam D hat. I mean, what's, what's the story with that? That's what I'm trying to understand. See, the trouble is, I don't know anything about this Arduino stuff. I don't have the experience to know how it's, um, how it's written. I mean, do they write all this stuff from scratch? Is that what they do?
see wiring private. I don't know what that is. What the hell is wiring? I'm just trying to look at the SPI profile here and I can't see exactly what they're using. I'm not seeing any how references, that's for sure. I'm just wondering how both can use the same code base. I mean, how do you know what the address of various registers are in order to talk to the peripherals? How is all that done? You must tell me somewhere. Where does this come from? Analog read internal. Where is that? What are these underscore functions? Are these like the low level stuff? Where does all this come from? Wiring private. Maybe it's wiring private. So wiring wire. Maybe it's in here. Wire dot H two wire. No, it's just a communications thing, right? Two wire. No. No, I don't think it's that. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know what it's doing here. Maybe these are just specific to Arduino land. Not having had experience with this code base, it's difficult for me to know. Um, Wiring. 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 Mm. Wiring. System clock. GPIO. Yeah, I tell you what, that looks like the old style. Um, the old style 
STM32 works, or even, yeah, I mean, the ADR stuff. So where does GPIO get defined then? Just like a structure, and then that's a register. So where does that come from? Wiring private. Where's wiring private? Here we go. Oh, here we go. This is where all the definitions are. Yeah, those are all the low level definitions. This is what I was looking for. And presumably these are the unique way of specifying it in Arduino land. So you're not using a HAL at all, you're using a kind of pseudo HAL in the Arduino world. So each one of these will probably include, you know, um, addresses. Hold on. Let's come back to this in a sec. That's why I'm private. So where does it find those files? Where are the STM ones? Don't know where it finds them, but it's definitely referring to them here. Don't know where each of these files is. So the grumpy old pizza slash official Arduino one seem to have their own written internal how. It talks to these peripherals. Although, where do these files come from? I don't know where these come from. I can't see where those are. are all to do with the um, host size, libraries we have a look at, system, stm, there we go, include, yeah, so if we look at these, so if we looked at, say, there must be a GPIO one here, Yeah, so there you've got all the register addresses. And then you've got variants by the looks of it. Depending on the chip selection. I guess these might be offsets or something. These are the offsets to the base addresses. These must be base addresses. And these are offsets for each of the pins. I see. So are those are all the same. So these are all the same names, but which one is selected depends on which model you've got. So for the 433, this would change. He would have added a 433 section to this, I guess. Do 
So you'd have to go through all of these with all of the peripherals. Good golly, that would be a lot of work. Flipping it. Yeah, so you don't have to do any of that stuff anymore in Rust because you just use the SVD file and have that converted. Damn. Yeah, I mean, all this stuff. All this stuff is defined in the SVD file. I bet there isn't a SVD to Arduino tool, is there? Okay, so I get an idea how it works. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of it. Jesus, doing that by hand would be one heck of a nightmare. My word. Um, system. I wonder if there's that. And then you've got all the Simsys ones. Yeah, those are standard. Oh dear, dear, yeah, doing it this way is tricky. The system tools. I wonder if there's anything in tools that automates any of this. Open OCT scripts. I'm thinking of build tools here really. No, it's just no. They must have some sort of automation, otherwise it'd be a nightmare. And yeah, these are just technical things. These are these scripts. Yeah. I can't see any kind of build stuff that would extract the relevant information from the um, SVD file. God, do people have to manually go through and do all of those? It must be a nightmare developing a new Arduino board if that's the okay. case. Bet they've got some sort of internal tools they use. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. So there's two different approaches. That's the native way, which looks absolutely painful. And then there's this way. So what does it say? Does it say these are built on the um on the how. What does it say? This repo adds support for the STM32 MCU and Arduino IDE. This supporting is based on STM32 cube MCU packages. Yeah. So it's based on the house that are provided by STM32. So it's a different way of going. Interesting. So there's two approaches we could take. I think going the um, grumpy old pizza way looks like a heck of a lot of work and some real dedication i'm really surprised that there isn't a tool that does the conversion of all those um, register names and addresses for the internal arduino how uh, and then there's this other method here which seems to map presumably the arduino how onto the um, STM32 how? Hmm. Wow, bit of a nightmare. I think this is the only practical way to go to get there easily, but I, don't, I have no experience of using this to know what it's like.
<laughs> it's always been such a nightmare for me to get the Arduino stuff to work, so. Might be worth trying this with an STM32 board that's already supported to see what it's like, I guess. There is quite a lot of stuff supported, so I've got a bunch of new player boards. I got one on this list. I have the those ones. I might have an O seven two or O seven A one. Um I don't, I don't have the, yeah, do I have, no, I don't have the L433. I have an L432. Uh, have that one, I think. Got a few discovery boards as well. Do I have? Uh, is it that one? Definitely got an F4 board. Maybe it's that one. I can't remember off the top of my head. Maybe it's a 308. Um, wow, they support the 157, that's interesting. Um, Trying one. Oh crikey, what a royal pain in the bottom. Right, so we have to look at. I don't know what you think um, on that line. I think the STM Duino would probably be the simpler approach. Oh, okay. There would need to be something without too much work being required. I think Laurie agrees with me. The blue pill, I've probably got one of those somewhere. Damn if I know where though. Mmm. So, I mean, if I was going to support C in some way on the um, logic deck, C slash C++, or C++, Arduino would look like the logical way to go because that's mostly supported. I mean, before we, we had it based on the STM32 HAL, but that wasn't really attractive to most people. It needs to be something that's popular. Yeah, you know, something that people already know. So they've got something familiar to switch from, I guess. 
So I kind of want a popular option alongside the Rust option. Popular C option alongside the Rust C option. Uh, Rust option. Which is why I was thinking going down the Arduino route might be um, a way of doing it. It would really help the lift if was somebody that knew the Arduino stuff as well. But, um, yeah, the, the um, STM32 Duino looks like the simplest route. <laughs> Somebody called Fergus, he wrote about it. <laughs> 32 Duino. Oh god, when was this written? When did I write this? Hold on, let's have a look. It's worth a laugh. A perfect storm. So this was written back in 2016, summer of 2016. Oh, this was, no, yeah, Ken wrote this. <laughs> I just reprinted it. This was written before that date. This date is wrong because this is a repost from Ken's blog. Probably from a few months earlier. I'm seeing Ken on Sunday, by the way. We're going out for a car. I haven't caught up in a while. Um, Raspberry Pi integration we talked about. Connectivity. This is quite interesting looking back. Half a decade ago, this was written a bit longer. Don't forget at that time, with the original board, we had Arduino headers on it as well as the PMOS, remember? So, and the Arduino headers were connected to the STM32. We had a couple of extra ones that extended those that were connected to both. This is the original MyStorm slash. Black Ice 1, if you like. Black Ice 0 and Black Ice 1. does say here the STM32 can be programmed using the STM32 Duino variant of the Arduino program. Don't forget that uh, also on the original version of the Black Ice, i.e. the MyStorm board, we had a different STM32 processor. We used, initially we used the STM32103, which was the same as what was used on the um, the, the original blue pill, which is why the STM32 Duino worked quite easily. It was just a change of some of the pins. Mm. 
wouldn't be so easy now because of all of the other changes. But interesting, yeah. Fairly interesting. Yes, it's a blast from the past. We did, you know, we we did originally conceive that people would use the um, Arduino. Um, Ken was also keen on using the embed libraries and stuff as well, and he did do some initial work with that. But the embed stuff kind of um, fell out of fashion a little bit. I mean, I know it's still used a lot, but... Oh, so, um, Laurie's saying here, um, I'm reasonably familiar with the Arduino implementation as I've done a board implementation down to the metal for Saxon Sock and Murex, i.e. a soft core with peripherals inside the FPGA. Well, you must know the low-level stuff then, mate. I say no. You've been through that curve of wrapping, you know, the Arduino how around it. I mean, what what is quite interesting, uh, Laurie, is you don't do that kind of stuff anymore. You know, with the advent of the SVD support, you know, when you've got things like SVD support files that give all the register mappings and stuff, you then have a tool that converts that into the required you know, header files with all the address, but register addresses, etc., and API stuff. Uh, and in Rust, that's completely automated. So, you know, you don't have to manually write all the um, header stuff anymore. Interesting. Yeah, I think if we do it, we'll probably just go the how route. Um, what other options are there? What other libraries could we go through? I'm not sure embed is particularly helpful. I'm not sure a lot of people are using it. I think Arduino is certainly um, in the open source world. The... Uh, Probably the most popular um, HAL abstraction, if you like. I know that's not not really how you'd um, describe Arduino, but I mean it has its own HAL, has its own library, you know, abstracts, etc. People are familiar with. It also has its own IDE, which drives me crackers, quite frankly. But lots of people are familiar with that. So, um, they used embed for the BBC microbit. What, what do people use on the microbit now? Is that still embed based or do they use Arduino code on that as well now? I know there's a Rust version for it actually. Thanks, <laughs> 
No, he says, but I've dabbled with lots of things and then forgot it all. Yeah, I know that feeling. I'm with you there, Laurie. Been down lots of those little parts. Uh, but the one thing I haven't really been down is the Arduino one, so... Yeah. There's always been lots of other people around that kind of knew it. But I didn't need to bother. Hmm. Interesting. What would be really good is to find someone that is willing to um, help on that side of things. Someone with some good Arduino, you know, familiarity. Certainly won't go supporting. Haven't spoken to Richard in ages. I've no idea what he's up to. I don't think I've spoken to him since pre-pandemic, actually. Have you heard from him at all, guy? Right, I think that will do me for today. It's nearly nine o'clock. Um, I've just got the mezzanine stuff to do, which I probably won't do tonight because I'm just too knackered. Um, maybe I'll do that on, um, if I get a chance, do a bit of that tomorrow and get it finished. And get all of these boards ordered because they're all sitting there ready. I've done the Gerbers for them all. Um, they're just sitting there waiting to be added to the order. Um, and I'll get that out on Sunday. So JLPCB will get my PCB order hopefully Monday morning. There, there, it'll be there Monday morning by the time I go out on Sunday. Okay, so I'm going to call it uh, call it quits for the evening. Right, well, thank you for joining me. Um, hopefully, you should be back to the normal Wednesday stream next week, and we can focus in on a bit of software, maybe do a bit of Rust work. I'd like to do some of the Rust porting for the Q's Pi the event system. That would be nice. Cool, right, well, ciao. I will see you all soon. Um, once again, catch me down on Discord um, or the forum uh, in between now and then. Otherwise, have a nice weekend, everyone, and um, I will see you on the next stream. <laughs>